Arlington Toyota wants to know what drives you. Let's start with having 500 Toyotas available. Plus, you get a lifetime warranty and 30 days to love your new purchase or exchange it. What drives you is what we do. Shop ArlingtonToyota.com today. Hey, welcome into this episode of The Book of Bo, brought to you by Arlington Toyota. Get 30 days to love your purchase or exchange it. Shop ArlingtonToyota.com. I think Tony may kill me for saying this, but I get emotional when I see that 71 because he probably could have played longer, but in our era, he's one of the top dominant left tackles that don't need any help from no tight end or anybody. As a broadcaster, you know when you're calling games for a Hall of Famer. You do. There's just something a little different about what they do and how they do it. There's nobody that that watched those games that Tony was a part of in those years with Jacksonville that didn't think he was a Hall of Famer. How grueling has it been? Well, if you'd asked me before I was a, a finalist, I'd have said, I'll do anything just to be a finalist. <laughs> The past decade plus has been good to our protagonist, Big Bo. As you'll find in this episode, he's got a host of successful business ventures, coached his kids' football teams, even co-hosted a radio show with yours truly. But since 2017, when the calendar flips from January to February, year in and year out, the omnipresent dread would begin again. Would Tony Baselli get the call from the Pro Football Hall of Fame? You know, all those years that he was crushed, you know, his face would crinkle every time the door didn't knock and the stupid phone rang for the, you know, the selection part. And um, that was really hard to watch. I think that the first time that I really realized like how big of a deal it was, was when like, I saw like Sir Mark like crying. I was like, okay, well this has to be a big deal then. You know, when you make, you're a finalist, everyone in the community, everyone knows, your family knows, your friends, everyone's rooting you on, they want you to make it. And then five times in a row, I get a phone call saying, I didn't make it. Which is hard enough just by yourself, but then you have your family and they're trying to console you, you have your friends and you have people in the community who mean so well. But the last thing I would want to talk about after I didn't make it is to have someone come up to me at a restaurant or in the streets and they mean well. I love them, but I don't want to talk about it. This is the Book of Bo. I'm Dan Hicken. I was around five years old. We were at five, five or six years old. We were at like a baseball, like little game in Ponte Vedra, like little league baseball game. And people started to come up to my dad and ask to take pictures. And I kind of didn't understand. I'm like, we lost the game. Why do people want to take pictures with my dad? That was shortly before the Baselli clan was transplanted to Houston and then Nashville with some stops in California sprinkled in between. Upon arrival back in the 904, Andrew Baselli, the oldest, was already familiar with his dad's popularity in town. His younger siblings, though, had been too young to truly understand during their first stint in Jacksonville. And I would see his name on the stadium, and I just thought it was cool, and it was fun to like when 
friends would come to games and be like, oh, look, there's my dad's name, or like, you know. But I never really realized who <laughs> my dad was um, until probably within the past five years. So, like, into my teenage years when I started, you know, hanging out with friends, and then they would have boyfriends, and they'd be like, your dad is Tony Baselli, <laughs> and I'd be like, uh, big whoop, like, yeah, he is, he's my dad, I love him, and like, I didn't realize that it was like a big deal. Because Angie and Tony never acted any differently than any of the other parents, the Baselli's were just like any other family, raising five kids in Ponte Vedra in the mid 2000s and into the 2010s. Andrew, the eldest, followed by Adam, Ashley, Lexi, and then little Ansley. We came up with a game when we were growing up. Uh, we called it the point game. And that was like one of the, like the number one ways that my dad, Andrew and I would all like connect. And so um, my dad would make sure to like spend time with us outside of, you know, work and stuff to like play games with us and be just like there for us. Like he was, he was better than us, like a lot of video games. Uh, he was better than us at <laughs> pretty much all the sports, but he never held back anything. He always had fun with us. So he was just a really fun, fun like dad to be around. Thankfully for homeschool, we were able to be home with him. Um, but I would say that on the weekends when he would call games, he would be out of town a lot for that. Yes, when the Baselli's returned to Jacksonville, Tony wasn't just running Whataburger with Mark Brunel. He had quickly risen the ranks as a national broadcaster with Fox. I think Tony, by his own admission, didn't really know what he was doing at that point. He got offered this job. He went with it. His instincts were really good. And maybe he was not put in the best position to succeed based on the circumstances around him. So when that ends, I think Tony's trying to figure out what it is he wants to do. He's got an interest, as we know, in many different business ventures. That's how his mind works and his ability to connect with others. That serves him very well, not just in the football world, but in the business world. But because he has so much insight and because football has been such a big part of his life, Tony can't help himself. He's got to talk football. And if someone is willing to pay him to talk football, even better. Hey, that's where I come in. Dan and I and him had become friends by then. At the end of the day, to be honest with you, Tony Vasily joined the show and was on the show because he was a fan of the show. He listened to the show every day. They call in, ah, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Or he text or he call. And so eventually with the station uh, continuing to grow, the chance to add a Tony Vasily into the morning, or as he would tell you, to save the program and to save the radio station. We brought him in and, you know, there was a transition. I'm not sure how long Tony was with us. Maybe a year feels like 12, but um, I think it was his ability to appreciate us, and get us like our humor and our sarcasm. And, you know, it, it, that allowed him to settle into that role. And it, it certainly, there is, there is a presence, right? Your audience realizes you've got the best Jaguar ever who's on the air as well. Tony is a, you know, can be a divisive person when you get into to opinionated subjects. So he fit right in with us when it came to that. But you used to like, true or not, did you often used to tell me, I'm national? Yeah, I'm no longer, I'm just- Now you're, you're a local slappy. Like you. Right. Yeah, yeah. I embrace it. Well, here's the I'm difference. Happy to be. Here's the difference. Here's I difference. choose to be <laughs> You have no choice. choice. Wow, I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, they got good pressure, they got good coverage. I mean, they have Mahomes dead to right. He's running left, running right, twisting around, going backwards. And then, just a little lob pass. I mean, how long can you cover great players? Eventually, Tony started working Jaguars preseason games before landing the full-time color commentator gig. Then he landed with Ian Eagle and friends on Westwood One on the weekly Thursday night games. Make no mistake though, he cut his teeth with Jeff and me. The cool thing was, it wasn't just Big Bo who moved back to Jacksonville following his playing days. I moved back to Jacksonville before he did. It was really super weird, right? We were in Orange County 
And we were like, uh, the Real Housewives of uh, Orange County was filmed in my neighborhood. And, and, and literally, it was the first one ever. And I could not stand the people that we were around. I was like, and this is, I tell my wife, she'd be like, hey, we're going to this thing and, and we're hanging out with these people and some of the wives are cool. And I was like, honey, I want to punch every single one of these husbands in the face. I can't, and that's not good. Violence is not good because that'll, that'll get me in jail. I'm like, I can't stand these people. I don't want to hang out with these guys. And so then we just, everywhere we go, we just said, is this what we want to be? This is what we want to do for the rest of our lives. Just keep up with the Jones in Orange County, California. And we said, no. And we'd come back to visit a few times and come to Jacksonville. And it was just like this sense of community with former Jaguar players here. And the, the, the just life was a lot slower here. A guy like me, fifth round draft choice in Washington. Nobody knows who I am in, in Washington. Now it's the commanders. I mean, Redskins are gone. Um, in Chicago, I mean, these are big cities. Nobody knows who Greg Huntington is. But in this city, people do simply because I was one of the original 10. I got a key to the city from Mayor Ed Austin. It's pretty neat. Um, and this is my home. It's, it's just good, easy living here. And I think that, you know, guys, you know, they come here, they move their families here, they enjoy it. You know, uh, for me, there was no sense of me going back to the Midwest and going back to the North. You know, I found home and, uh, and I, I enjoy being here in the part of this community. It was a comfort for Angie and Tony to know so many former Jaguars were here. But for some ex-teammates, it was a necessity to reunite with that community. I came back to Jacksonville because, let me see, about four years ago, my mom, my dad passed away in January and my mom passed away in May. So I was in a very, very dark place and I got a phone call for two guys who I loved dearly and told me to come back to Jacksonville. One was the Mangler and the other one was Dave Waddell. They called me up to say, man, get your butt to Jacksonville. The people still love you here. Statistically speaking, there's not a ton of former NFL players that call themselves former Jaguars. But for those who do, it's something they have the utmost pride in, especially the first Jaguar draft pick, Big Bo. Come on. Still to come. But when they told me I didn't make it in 2021, you know, I was sitting there in my office. I got the phone call from David Baker, who was then the president of the, of the Hall of Fame. And uh, he said, you didn't make it. He goes, but I know you're going to make it next year. I just got a great feeling you're going to make it next year. And I said, David, I appreciate that. Uh, I really don't care right now. He goes, well, what, you know. And I said, I'm actually not disappointed for myself at this time. Because I really wasn't. Like in the big scheme of things, what I was dealing with with my dad and and what we'd been through the last year at the pandemic and me being hospitalized with COVID and Angie having two cancer bouts and what she'd been through, like getting told, no, I was in the Hall of Fame while I was disappointed. It wasn't the, like at the top of the list of disappointments for, for 2021 and 20, for 2020 and 2021. Hope you're enjoying this episode of The Book of Bo, brought to you by Arlington Toyota. Get 30 days to love your purchase or exchange it. Shop ArlingtonToyota.com. Now back to The Book of Bo. Family has always been first and foremost. Like for all of us, we call ourselves Team Baselli. And um, I think that every member of my family like believes that and like bleeds that. What began as Team Baselli among Big Tony and Uncle Bud's clan was now on full display in Jacksonville, FLA. Team Baselli stuck together through thick and thin, whether it was in Miami in February 2020, when Tony was denied entry into the Pro Football Hall of Fame for a fourth straight year, or less than two months later, when a global pandemic struck and Tony was suddenly in the ICU with COVID-19. It was definitely a whirlwind of emotions. I mean, you find out that your dad has COVID. At first, we think that he's joking, that he's just being dramatic. We're like, you're just, you have a man cold. You're just being dramatic. Like, you're fine, come on. It was very scary. 
because we didn't know anything about COVID. He was like ground zero for COVID. When he got sick, I, it broke my heart because I said, I hope he is well enough to when he get in the Hall of Fame, he can enjoy it. So I prayed and I said, Lord, just, I mean, he was really sick too. And I, I, he had me so worried. And that was, you know, seeing him and his wife in Miami was just such an embrace, man. I hope we both get in, cause we always said that. But when he got sick, it scared me. Like a lot of guys like Sam Mills and Cliff Branch, these guys aren't here to embrace being in the Hall of Fame. And that's the one thing we do. That's the anxiety of trying to waiting on the Hall of Fame. You want to be around to enjoy it, especially with COVID. Tony spent five days in the ICU at the Mayo Clinic before finally being released. But then another challenge. I hurt my back and I was at the orthopedics office for my back, knowing full well that that was something pretty curable, pretty, you know, just tell me how to get it better type situation. And two weeks later, I'm on the operating table, you know, getting cancer removed from my body, only to find out I had another cancer two, three weeks later that was being removed from my body. I don't think any of us had any time to think, you know, we all just, it's life and you take it in stride and you do it with your family. But just when it seemed like 2020 would finally take a turn for the better, another challenge was presented for Team Baselli. The OG Baselli, Grandpa Big Tony, back home out west, was diagnosed with cancer. When I had stopped playing football a few years ago, um, one of the first places I visited was there. And uh, it was just super fun uh, to be able to play sports again like we went golfing we went surfing boogie boarding and stuff and it was really nice like have those like outlets that were super fun that he like led me to and like um it didn't seem like anything was different you know when a lot of the rest of my life had like felt like it was changing he was still just happy grandpa with all of his fun toys later in my grandpa's life as he started to we got sicker, they moved back here. And that was really great for me. So I got to spend a lot more quality time with them. A lot of the times I see him was group trips and things like that. Once they took uh, moved back here, cause he was seeing a doctor here. I got to go golfing one-on-one with my grandpa. We had to just have kind of long talks over dinner and just chili dogs, just talking, me and him. It hit me immediately when he said, you were not making the Hall of Fame, that my dad wouldn't be there. Or most likely, cause he was really, you know, this is end of January. Um, 2021. He's not in good shape. Uh, he was just about to move here uh, to get treatment at MD Anderson uh, and then ultimately a little bit at Mayo. And uh, I knew odds were he wasn't going to make it to 2022. And uh, so that was hard. Again, you handle it together and you cherish the time that we had, the relationships that we had. Um, I'm just so grateful that, you know, we got extra time here in Jacksonville for the end with him. You probably heard about Big Bo's COVID bout. You may have heard about Angie, but Big Tony's cancer fight? That was the final straw of 2020-21 that shook Team Baselli most of all. Tony, Angie, the kids, Tony's stepmom, Big Tony's second wife, Carla, his sister, Jennifer, brother, Michael, his two half-sisters, Moo and Fred, the cousins, Angie's family, because it was a team. My dad choked up and started, I cried at the eulogy and I was a wreck. I was like, I've never seen my dad in that state before. Um, and I think that what I have admired about my dad's relationship with his dad is honor, respect, and like the love for family. Um, he was like his respect for authority and um, his respect for the leaders in his life um, really 
really instilled in me and I know all my siblings. And we all love our dads and we all respect our dads. Tony loved and respected his dad. His dad was his hero. Not everyone's dad is their hero. Plenty of kids got other heroes. I'm sure Tony's uh, someone's hero that's, and it's not his son per se. You know, I really learned just how much Tony Baselli wanted to impress his dad. Forget Tom Coughlin, forget the Hall of Fame, forget the Jaguars Sunday, forget Jason Taylor or Bruce Smith. Tony, I feel like his, his, his day-to-day -day task was to make his dad proud of him. I mean, that was important to him. That was tough because uh, I know how much he would have enjoyed it. And I know how much fun it would have been having him a part of this journey. Um, so at least my wife did the next best thing of getting him to make a video for me. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. Slow your roll, Don Anthony Baselli Jr. Don't give away the big surprise. We got to start with the other surprise video. Angie helped orchestrate with one Anthony Munoz and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Dave Baker, you know, retires. Jim Porter is now the president. And uh, we've had several conversations about, you know, how do you do it now? And, uh, you know, several conversations about, wouldn't it be great? Let's say you're a running back and you, you know, with this new process, you got to get noticed that you're going in the Hall of Fame. And what if Jim Brown or Marcus Allen or Emmett or Barry knock on your door with their gold jacket and say, you know, I, I'm a running back. Anthony, welcome to the team, man. Welcome to Canton. She does call me for the call. And my kids are all right there. And I knew it was the call. And so I am trying to like fake it. And I'm like, Oh yeah, well, I don't really know when the Jags are, I'm telling her some baloney story with the kids right there to throw them off. Angie eventually escaped to a friend's house and called the Hall of Fame back. From there, they concocted Tony's secret knock from his old pal, Anthony. All of a sudden, Tony's the guy and they say, are you willing to fight down to Jacksonville and do the knock? And I said, am I jogging down there? Am I driving down there? Are you gonna find me down there? I'll be down there. I had to change my the name um, in my phone because Andrew and Ansley were just, again, stalking it. As this thing's kind of building up, my dad started to think he didn't make it because he's like, if I would have made it, I would have known by now. So we started to get pissy. We're going to family dinners. He's getting upset and we all like inside laughing, laughing, laughing. Like he's, he's gonna freak out. So it turns to the day, we're all hiding in the garage. My dad, we set up a fake business meeting for him at one of his buddy's houses. We were all in that little garage and my brothers were kept talking and I was so mad at them. I was like, shut up, like he's coming right now. People were like laying flat down the ground. And my grandma was hiding in a closet. My brother was in a golf cart. You gotta give Angie a lot of credit, man. To keep it under wraps for as long as she did and to get it set up the way she did and Tony had no clue and to have the whole family there behind me when uh, when he opened up the door and I, I welcomed him to the Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, it was like, she did an amazing, amazing job. When he had just like hugged Anthony and then got the, you know, it was announced and he saw my mom, that was like top five moments for me. Like, I just envisioned them in college when they met and then here they are today after five kids, moves, you know, that was really special. <laughs> you know how I feel about your game, man, right? Yeah. I've told you year after year, welcome to Canton. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather get you this news from the oh, man. No one else. Thank you. And it is an honor and a privilege, man, to no be idea. with it's you and to do this. You're the man I looked up to all those years. Man. This is who I wanted to be. Well, now, you know, hey, we both played at SC, but now we can say we're teammates forever. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you guys one thing together? I just want to say it is an honor and a privilege 
to have you join our team of Hall of Famers as a class of 2022. <laughs> So, Tony, what you're feeling right now? Um, you know what? Uh, this is the sixth year, and you get the phone call saying you're not in, and you're like, okay, well, maybe next year. And everyone else is crying. And I'm they're going, who's supposed to be sad here? <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, if I could, uh, I wouldn't trade it, the pro how this worked, because there's no one else I'd rather knock on the door than the guy I looked up to and who I think is the greatest to ever play the game at the position I played. We went to school together, and... Uh, like, I remember when people used to compare me to him, and I'm like, well, that's nice, but I think he's better than I am. <laughs> uh, Steve, my only regret is, you know, my dad passed away uh, last year, so I was yeah. really hoping last year would have been, so I, he could have done uh, been a part of it. Um, but I know he's uh, in heaven, watching down, yeah. smiling right now, so. And oh, Angie still had one more trick up her sleeve a couple weeks later when Tony was formally announced as a Hall of Famer. I am so incredibly grateful that Tony was so vulnerable to me and actually told me um, that when he didn't make it the year before and his dad was there, um, and when I say was there, it was a COVID year. So Tony found out in his office alone that he had not made it and he came home and he shared with me, he's like, the worst part about that phone call this year is I'm just afraid that if I ever do get the nod and I do make it into the hall, my dad may not be there. And that instantly, like, I was like, oh yes, he will. With the help of the Jaguars video team, Angie was able to get Big Tony on camera, congratulating little Tony just days before he passed away after a months long fight with melanoma his dad's face popped up on the screen. And he literally, his whole like countenance, like he was literally like, and then he dropped to his you know, knees and literally had to put his head down. And I was just like, he got the moment. You know, he, he got that moment. on a million miles a minute and they have five kids to take care of and they still make time for one another and it's something so special to watch it just seems like the longer the relationship goes on the older they get the closer they get and the sweeter the relationship gets and so it's definitely something that all of us kids look up to is um, I always joke with my parents you make it really hard to find a good man in this world because your guys relationship is something that it's very hard to come by obviously it didn't they didn't start off that way it's 27 years in the making but it's something super special and something super sweet that we definitely are incredibly grateful for I mean there's a lot of blessings and a lot of good things about being a professional football player but there's also I mean he, he mentioned he alluded to pressure being like a franchise player um, and how that like take a, took a toll on him uh, and how uh, he handled it so well and I would say um, that him and my mom and how they handled it uh, like I, I probably I mean he he knows that he could not probably have done it without my mom and so I'm um, the way that they've kind of walked through such a difficult uh, lifestyle um, pressure wise is really really admirable and then how they, uh, in today's culture, uh, there's not a lot of, um, I'd, I'd, it's rare to see people like my parents who love each other so uh, well and faithfully. And so seeing that is like super, super cool and, and inspiring for me. This franchise is the best franchise in the NFL. This is the best city to live in, and you guys are the best fans. Jaguars have been great. I mean, like, I love that organization. I love being part of it. Um, 
you know, we've had our ups and downs like any in any relationship, but I love it. I love that place. I love the city. And I'm glad I, I I'm glad I didn't let my emotions or myself become bitter or angry because uh, I would have missed out on the last, you know, 20, 19, 20 years, whatever it is. The long asked question has finally been answered. Don Anthony, Tony Baselli Jr., the former Fairview High School JV Waterboy, the three time All American at USC, the first pick of the Jacksonville Jaguars, is a pro football Hall of Famer. But I tell you how the legacy of Tony Baselli, there's a great tackle coming up. He was a, a sophomore, junior, Pomona High School. And the coach said, I didn't say it to me, but he said, hey, you're going to be the next Tony Baselli. That says it all. I mean, it truly is amazing that, I mean, Tony Baselli's in the Hall of Fame and he's only played, he only played eight years. That just goes to show you how dominant of a player he was. Um, but I think those of us, that those that know, know. He's not really big on accolades and, you know, awards and all this, but I know it means a lot to him to be honored by the profession that he loved. Um, so I think I'll just be really happy for him. We have our first Hall of Fame, which signifies that this community is for real in the National Football League. Once you're in, you're in. You know what, people can talk about it all they want, argue, you know, have different opinions, but he can write Tony Baselli, HOF 22 now. And it's not written in the sand. It can't be washed away. It's engraved in bronze. The fact that this is his legacy, the fact that this is how he will go down in history, at the that he really is among the best to ever step foot on the football field. That was his goal. If someone would have told that kid playing football at Fairview that you're gonna go play, be in the NFL for eight years, but really play for seven. So last year, you're not gonna play Texans at all. Um, but you're gonna play at the highest level, be considered one of the best to ever play the game when you were playing it and get paid the money you got paid, but we're told it was only gonna last seven or eight years. Would you take that? Hell yeah, I would've taken it. The Book of Bo, narrated by yours truly, your favorite media mogul, longtime Jacksonville sports anchor and host, Dan Hicken. It was written and produced by Jacksonville's second favorite media mogul, Mia O'Brien. It was filmed and edited by the guy who should be your favorite person in all the media, Graham Marsh. Special thanks to the entire Baselli family for their time, their photos, videos, and for sharing their story. Special shout out to Moo Moo for all the photos, as well as associate producer and the casting coordinator of the Book of Bo, Andrew Baselli. Me and Graham owe you a drink at Surfer when you get back from Canton. Thanks to GM Steve Griffin and the entire team at 1010XL for their unwavering support of this labor of love. Thanks to Arlington Toyota for driving the project. Thanks to all the friends, former teammates, and more who helped bring the Book of Bo to life. And hey, while we're on the subject of thank yous. Are Dan and Jeff getting a shout out? Yeah, they're still not, they haven't made, they're still, they're still there, but there's a good chance they could hit the cutting floor. Just don't tell them that until the day of. Come on! Hope you enjoyed this latest episode of The Book of Bow, brought to you by Arlington Toyota. Get 30 days to love your purchase or exchange it.
Shop Arlington Toyota.com.